and welcome back to another episode. So tonight's content is going to be concerned with some periodization issues involving how we get from the avant-garde to the postmodern and how modernism overlaps with the avant-garde and issues like that. But most of all, what I want to focus on is a view of the postmodern itself that I've been developing. Um, I've come up with an idea as a way to frame what is meant by postmodern art in general. And I'm not really pushing this definition except as a way to have a kind of analytical strategy for breaking down the meaning of postmodern art, suggesting a way to look at postmodern art, how to understand it, how to assess its, its success or failure, and those sorts of things. So what I'm going to do is just start right off with my proposal about how to think about postmodern art and what it really is in its core. And my idea is simply that postmodern art really begins with the idea that art is something collaborative in the sense that the meaning that gets attributed to a work of art is recognized by the artist in his or her creation of their artwork as perhaps an incomplete project, as something that can be given fuller meaning, can be completed in its uh, attempt to mean something only with the collaboration of the person in the audience, the viewer, the auditor, whether we're talking about painting or music or whatever the medium is. Um, it might be, a, might be a novel. And that goes hand in hand with Leotard's proposal in The Postmodern Condition that what characterizes the postmodern is an incredulity toward meta narratives. And the idea there being simply that meta narratives are narratives that are created, uh, ideological systems, you might say, that are constructed, that are about the narratives that we go through our lives with in our daily existence. So you can take the word meta and just think about. To give an example, you might say um, Karl Marx in the Communist Manifesto. And the idea there being that history is a contest of forces that arise between different social classes and that the dialectical unfolding of history can be understood in terms of the underlying economic structures within a society, as well as the conflict between different classes within society that ultimately gives a society its dynamism that is um, propelling it forward into the future as it moves along. So that's a meta narrative in the sense that it is a story that can be told about another story, which is the story of history. And what Leotard says is that when we get to the postmodern era, we have an incredulity toward meta narratives of all sorts. And certainly after 1968 in France, after the years when Stalin was in charge in the Soviet Union, there was a loss of faith in the idea of communism. Uh, the communism never really recovered. 
uh, after that point in Europe and France during that time period or in England. Uh, but the most common example that's given is probably religion, the progressive loss of immediate faith in religious doctrines as another sort of meta narrative that people might have a uh, incredulity towards a certain skepticism, you might say. So there the meta narrative would be a story you could tell about morality, a story you could tell about creation, uh, a story you could tell even about history and where history is going. So coming back to my idea again about what defines postmodern art, it goes a little bit further than Lyotard, but it also builds on Lyotard. So the idea being the artist, whether they realize it in, within themselves or recognize it within themselves or not, as an artist working within a postmodern framework, is not going to automatically assume that the reader or the viewer is going to be able to have a straightforward interpretation of their work. That's never something an artist can take for granted in the postmodern period in the way that you could take that more or less for granted within a sacred setting uh, in the Renaissance or in the medieval period where you have a work of art that is placed inside of a cathedral and the cathedral itself does the framing the institutionality of the of the of the cathedral does the framing that helps to situate the meaning of the work of art in the case of postmodern artwork you can't just take for granted that someone is going to have a structured meta narrative that uh, they would be able to share with someone else that would help to have a reliable way of having the work of the artist be understood by the person who views it or listens to it or reads it. Instead, where I think postmodern art actually ends up going is in the direction of saying that if an artist is doing this, when the artist creates that work, if it's a postmodern work, it's created with the understanding that its meaning won't be fully understood or fully grasped by the intention of the artist, that there's going to be an act of interpretation that has to go into understanding and fully appreciating the work of art and that's never something that the artist can do themselves. The artist can't bring a person to a canvas or to a piece of music and require that they look at that work of art from a certain point of view that the artist intends. Instead, the artwork is something that's laid open to the public it's made accessible. And as far as the, the meaning of the artwork itself, it is always up for grabs. You can't develop any kind of meta narrative out of it because the creation of meaning is always going to be something that's localized, something that's localized between an individual and the work of art and through the work of art to the artist. So it's in that sense a form of communication, and you can have a successful kind of communication, or you can have an unsuccessful communication. Uh, a work of art might really move someone if that communication is successful or not, if the person viewing the work of art just isn't really into it. And for the postmodern seen. I think that's, you know, just something that you accept. It's part of whether art communicates something 
rather than art saying something that makes art successful in the postmodern ambit. So I want to um, return to Foucault a little bit. And before Foucault, I want to refer all the way back to Lionel Trilling. Lionel Trilling wrote this um, essay that I thought was just wonderful to read. It's in a book called The Idea of the Modern. But the essay itself is called On the Modern Element in Modern Literature. And the essay is all about Trilling's experience in teaching literature classes on contemporary literature, modern literature. And he's writing this in the 50s. And so he's thinking of modern literature, contemporary literature, as having students read works by people like Proust and Joyce. And what are some of the other ones? People like T.S. Eliot, uh, William Faulkner, people like that. He actually doesn't doesn't uh, mention Faulkner, but you know Faulkner is part of that same group. You know, and he what he says about this is that the English department and where he was, which was at Columbia University, had never taught courses like that, um, and the students kind of revolted and just demanded that courses on modern literature be taught. I guess like students of all times and places, they wanted their education to have some kind of relevance that they could really feel. And the English department at Columbia had been teaching works of literature only up to the 19th century and then just stopping. And Trilling makes a point of saying, you know, in the department, people just thought, well, you know, these students probably don't understand how difficult it is to read these, um, these works. But whatever, we'll just throw these books at them and they can have at it if they really want to do that so much. But what Trilling says was that his, his actual trepidation uh, before teaching the class was not so much its difficulty and you know, these are very difficult works. But it was the feeling that these works really communicated something that um, had a certain intimacy to it. If you really wanted to grasp what these works were all about, it wasn't the, it wasn't the construction of a literary theory that would bring out the meaning of the work, but the way in which they, they touched certain elements of your experience that ended up being personal and private. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a passage here that brings this out a little bit. I do not know how other teachers deal with this extravagant personal force of modern literature, but for me, it makes difficulty. Nowadays, the teaching of literature inclines to a considerable technicality. But when the teacher has said all that can be said about formal matters, about verse patterns, metrics, prose conventions, irony, tension, etc., he must confront the necessity of bearing personal testimony. He must use whatever authority he may possess to say whether or not a work is true. And if not, why? And if so, why so? He can do this only at considerable cost to his privacy. How does one say that Lawrence is right in his great rage against the modern emotions, against the modern sense of life and ways of being, unless one speaks from the intimacies of one's own feelings and one's own sense of life and one's own wished-for way of being? How, except with the implication of personal judgment, does one say to students of Gide, to say, say to students that Gide is perfectly accurate in his representation of the awful boredom 
and slow corruption of respectable life. Then probably one rushes on in to say that this doesn't of itself justify homosexuality and the desertion of one's dying wife. Certainly not. But then again, having paid one's devoir to morality, how does one rescue from morality Gede's essential point about the supreme rights of the individual person, and without making it merely historical and totally academic? So here we have Trilling trying to explain a kind of perplexity that he finds himself in as an instructor. On the one hand, in order to teach these things, there are certain formal procedures that go into it. There are certain ways of constructing an interpretation and so on and so forth. But then there's also a side which seems to be the side that modern art, modern literature in particular, uh, is really evocative of, which is that personal poignant experience, um, experience of things that are difficult to talk about, experiences that reveal certain private aspects of your life that might be difficult to discuss or even inappropriate to discuss in some cases, in a room full of students. There's a sense in which what modern art does, and I'm thinking of maybe something like a Faulkner novel, that ends up hitting certain places within your soul with a, with a certain degree of poignancy. And that takes me back again to this idea of postmodern art as involving a transaction a kind of communication, a, a kind of incompleteness of meaning without the reader. And I think in a modern context, you perhaps have that same dynamic, but I'm not sure about the extent to which modern authors in their writing have completely abandoned meta narratives to the extent that a postmodern author might have maybe uh, within the text of a Faulkner novel or um, a Hemingway novel, you can still count on a certain framework of meaning, a certain framework of shared values and ethics and ethical norms that might be a little bit more radically displaced and less uh, taken for granted as we move forward out of the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and into the 60s, 70s, 80s. Okay, so the next piece to this puzzle that I want to bring in is Foucault. And what I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm trying to balance Trilling's experience of modern literature with what Foucault has to say about how we have to analyze ourselves as readers, uh, taking ourselves into that more postmodern atmosphere. So here's Foucault at the very end of his essay, What is Enlightenment? Um, I'm going to first read a short quotation from page 46 that's found in um, the Foucault Reader. So Foucault says, This entails an obvious consequence, that criticism is no longer going to be practiced in the search for formal structures with universal value. Uh, and that is criticism, he points out. So that's on the side of the interpreter. But rather, as a historical investigation into the events that have led us to constitute ourselves and to recognize ourselves as subjects of what we are doing, thinking, and saying. So for Foucault, it's important to recognize one's own situatedness within a culture, within history, within society. And as postmodern people, as postmodern individuals, we 
because we are past that point where we are so much looking to meta narratives to define what we think and believe, we are actually more in the habit of looking at our immediate cultural context and looking at ourselves in terms of people who have been shaped by history and the cultural forces that surround us. And what Foucault is saying here is that to do any kind of honest philosophical critique, that is where we have to begin with ourselves as interpreters. So further down on the same page, page 46, he says, I mean that this work done at the limits of ourselves must on the one hand open up a realm of historical inquiry and on the other put itself to the test of reality, of contemporary reality, both to grasp the points where change is possible and desirable and to determine the price form the precise form this change should take. This means that the historical ontology of ourselves must turn away from all projects that claim to be global or radical. And here, I think you can see another instance of Foucault turning away from what Lyotard describes as meta narratives, from the universal, the global, some kind of grand construction that you can build even out of history and toward the local, toward the individual. And that's also something that characterizes postmodernism. And that in turn, you can relate back to my idea about a personal communication between a work of art and the person interacting with it. One more example comes from the very end of the essay in which Foucault is describing a new kind of approach to philosophy, a new way of doing philosophy. It seems to me that Kant's reflection is even a way of philosophizing that has not been without its importance or effectiveness during the last two centuries. The critical ontology of ourselves has to be considered not certainly as a theory, a doctrine, nor even as a permanent body of knowledge that is accumulating. It has to be conceived as an attitude, an ethos, a philosophical life in which the critique of what we are is at one and the same time the historical analysis of the limits that are imposed on us and an experiment with the possibility of going beyond them. So here Foucault sounds very much like an existentialist where he's emphasizing the historical moment and the present historical moment as the moment that has its greatest significance and that can localize for us a place in which we can find meaning. So it's really the present moment that we need to be concerned with most of all in our looking into history to find meaning and help us discover who we are. We ultimately have to come back to the present moment to find relevance um, to, you know, from our personal vantage point to the rest of society around us. But the other thing is that we are creators of meaning. Um, ever since Nietzsche modern man, and here when you add everything else into what Foucault was saying, postmodern man, is a creature that has to take on the work of creating, creating meaning, creating significance, understanding um, society and his or her place in society. And what you could say postmodern art does the social function that it could serve, just like the kind of philosophizing that Foucault is gesturing toward here, is a kind of art that helps the individual do that. So by interacting with postmodern art, with a postmodern novel, with a postmodern style painting, one can build a bridge between one's own personal experience and 
a larger context of experience by building that bridge of communication between one's own experience, the experience of the artwork, and through that to the artist. And in doing that, no kind of overarching meaning is ever achieved that you could go and give to someone else and tell them the work means this. When I looked at so-and-so's painting, the meaning it has is this. Because one of the basic ideas behind this approach to art is that it builds a bridge, but it also evades any kind of meaning that could become some sort of universalizing, uh, totalizing, uh, ideological you know, sense about what something means if it came to that. So I feel like um, there are a few things I should add to this. I feel like there might be some important elements that I'm leaving out what I would like to say, finally, about all this is um, when you actually apply it to somebody like Andy Warhol, and let's just take this on as, a, as an experiment that we can do together, interacting with pop art, and, and just apply the principle and see how it works. And one of the things that I think people find difficult about Andy Warhol is precisely that those silk screens of um, Marilyn Monroe or, you know, the soup cans or, you know, whatever it is, uh, the bananas, those are representations that are objects that we don't associate deep meaning with. And when we see them in a museum, I think for that very reason, it's kind of hard to cross that bridge to find some kind of meaning in them. And at the same time, that might be a clue to understanding the painter, the artist himself. So these are works of art that don't just avoid meta-narratives. They, they tend to avoid the attribution of any sort of meaning to them at all. And I think it actually is a way, or could be considered a way, of reflecting on society itself. So what do we have in the images that surround us? How can we think about them? Are they images that come to us with meaning, like religious images? You know, going back to the example of religious art in the Middle Ages, the kind of meaning that they have is very stable, it's very well-founded. There's an entire institution behind preserving the stability of those meanings. But what we have in a modern art gallery, when we are looking at four different silkscreen images of Marilyn Monroe, is exactly the opposite kind of context. It's a social context in which we, as postmoderns, have to try to find a way to come to meaning on our own terms. There's no meta narrative that can be invoked although we could try, but there's no meta-narrative that's being invoked on the part of the painter himself, the artist himself, to give you a clue in any way whatsoever how to interpret these images. Instead, you as the viewer have to do that. And when you look at them, you might simply say, well, that's very amusing. And I think that's actually the way people do look at Andy Warhol. It's pop art, and what's its significance? Well, it doesn't have any significance. It simply is what it is. It's just, it's just pop. It's just pop art. 
But in another sense, we can actually just think about what that pop means, you know, which is really something that escapes a meta narrative. But at the same time, another aspect of an artwork like that, and especially the one with Marilyn Monroe, is if it if it's compared with a traditional religious work of art, uh, we can bring in Walter Benjamin's idea about an erratic quality about traditional religious art. So there's something about traditional religious art that gives it a certain aura, a certain aura of significance and meaning. And in a certain sense, you could say that there's something about the celebrity of Marilyn Monroe, maybe, that from that point of view of her celebrity, her historical significance to pop culture, um, that she has a certain aura. However, the kind of aura that you are able to experience with religious art is one that's suffused with meaning. It has stability. The kind of aura that you experience through the celebrity of Marilyn Monroe as it's depicted in Warhol's work is not one that's given to you, at least as I experience, in such a way that you are brought into the work in such a way that it's inviting you to think about the, the celebrity of Marilyn Monroe. It's more... It's more something that tends to steer you in the direction of the simple reproducibility of that image. So, so while it invokes Marilyn Monroe as a celebrity with a certain amount of aura, it also deflates the significance of that aura by simply reproducing it over four times, which takes us into the way in which the reproduction of art tends to deflate that very erratic quality that religious art had. So at the end of the day, I think what you can take from it is simply that it is a pure reflection of the postmodern condition. When we look at the image, it simply stares blankly back at us and in a sense, it is throwing pop culture in our faces and asking us to understand ourselves as people who, instead of moving within the cathedral of meaning, are moving within the cathedral, actually not the cathedral, that's probably not what I want to say, but moving within maybe a pseudo-cathedral of... Um, reproduced works of art, mechanically reproduced works of art that no longer require mastery and craftsmanship in their construction, but instead require techniques like silk screening and that kind of stable, deep meaning that we might want to ascribe to something that, that maybe as an interpreter we would even aspire to ascribe to it is simply something that it avoids and um, does so very successfully, but at the same time reveals something to us about our condition as people living within a modern consumerist society. So with that, that is my theory about postmodern art. I don't think there's anything I have left out that I still want to say, although Probably more could be said about it, and I'm going to leave it with that.